Aloha everyone, and welcome to Josh's Women Who Lead Virtual Talk Story Session. I'm Raina Kaneko, President of Josh, and I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker for this session entitled, Silver Linings and Redesigning a Business. <clears throat> in our Women Who Lead Talk Stories, Josh showcases women leaders in our community who are paving the way in their professions and lifestyles setting great examples for us all. Today, we are proud to present Tana Dang, owner of Eden and Love, a lifestyle boutique with locations in Honolulu and Las Vegas. While brick and mortar and online retail is Eden and Love's main focus, Tana's true inspiration lies in creating opportunities through entrepreneurship and teaching others how to curate the perfect blend of life work integration. In 2020, amidst the challenges of the COVID pandemic, Tana sought to find new opportunities in retail and has since expanded Eden and Love's online presence while growing an exclusive line of products dubbed the Heart of Eden. We look forward to hearing how Tana pivoted and continued to flourish during this last year. Our moderator is Manshali Ota, owner of Nimbus Unlimited LLC, a marketing and magic consultancy based in Pearl City, Hawaii. Manshali is an award-winning English-Japanese bilingual marketing leader with more than 15 years experience creating successful integrated marketing strategies for Hawaii's premier healthcare, finance, retail, and travel and tourism organizations. Manshali is a member of JASH's Gen Advisory Committee. Welcome, Tana and Manshali. And Manshali, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Raina, for that introduction. And welcome, everyone, to today's talk story with Tana Dang of Eden and Love. Um, I'm Monchali, I'll be your moderator today. And as uh, Raina mentioned, I, um, I'm a one woman marketing and magic uh, shop. And I specialize again in integration, um, both of digital and traditional marketing integration, as well as how do you integrate energy work and find alignment within your own life. Um, I'm really excited and honored to be working with Tana today and, and talking story with her. Um, love Eden in love, uh, have lots of things from there, buy lots of gifts from there. And so, you know, really um, um, excited to be sharing your story with everyone else and, and, you know, learn more about where you've been and how things have been going since the pandemic. Um, today, she's gonna share about being an entrepreneur um, how the pandemic challenged her to be creative and lead her down new paths, and then talk a little bit about silver linings, um, which is really important for today's conversation. So, Tana, can you give a little bit about yourself as well as about Eden and Love? Of course. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and it was it's really nice to not only meet you, to be here with you, to share a story. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I think there are so many things that I want to tell everybody about Eden Love, but I think the most important thing is, yes, we are a boutique, but more than that, we are a company that was really built to be able to give and to give in many ways, whether it is to give back to our community through um, fundraisers, through donations, whether it's to just do something really cool and unexpected. So to create some kind of really fun experience or to create opportunities for, for people, for women, for men that want to work for Eden Love and really create a career in retail. Um, it's all of those things kind of wrapped up into all of my, my passions, my loves, the things that I'm most interested in. So Eden Love really has become a reflection of, of me. And hopefully the things that you see, the things that you have purchased, the cute totes, the, the great smelling candles are all things that were birthed out of our experiences, our travel. Yes, the guava eucalyptus is my favorite. Um, it's all of those things that we really love wrapped up into one. So I'm so lucky that I am the creator and the founder and the entrepreneur of this boutique that I love. But really more than anything, it is a lifestyle boutique. It's really supposed to be a place that just make 
people happy, not just women, not just men, but just people happy in general. Awesome. So, you know, you talk about making people happy and creating these experiences and, and that really embody your passions. And all of that was challenged last year um, because as with many businesses, Eden and Love faced never before seen challenges um, for doing yeah. business mm -hmm. and, and no way to anticipate any um, anything that happened last year. Yeah. So, can you share with us some of those challenges and then how you were able to pivot and to transform the way that you conduct business and the way that you really approached your business? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think just in that little brief introduction that I had mentioned, everything was about things that I loved, right? Ever since the creation of Eden Love, which started back in 2007, um, originally, my husband and I purchased a business called The Wedding Cafe, and that was our very first baby business, and it was a wedding resource center. When we moved down to um, Ward Warehouse in 2007, so we're in Manoa with The Wedding Cafe since 2004, funny story, married, started the business at the exact same time, so all we know is how to run a business together. 2007, we moved on to Ward Warehouse and we realized, oh my gosh, we have to do way more than sell soup sandwiches and acai bowls in order to pay our rent. So we started bringing in some necklaces and a small rack of like bags and a small rack of clothing where women would go upstairs and try on their like dresses next to our chicken bottles, the mayonnaise bottles. We would tell Bryson, you can't go upstairs, people are changing. It was kind of a like just a makeshift mock boutique in the beginning. We didn't even call it a boutique. It was just we have clothing in the side. We have bags on the side of our, our cafe and our wedding resource center. So as the boutique started growing and growing, really every single product that we brought in were things that I loved. If I really loved these earrings, I would bring in 20 and see if we could sell 20. If I really loved the bag that I wanted to carry, we would bring in say five and sell those, same for clothing. It just started to grow and grow and grow and grow. So we were on a high for the last 10 years, just going and pumping and creating events and our Black Friday events were huge, our birthday party events were huge. Then all of a sudden COVID hit and everything changed. And like I said in the intro, if my whole goal was to create happiness and pump out joy and happiness and fun experiences through Eden and Love, I couldn't do any of those things. And that was heartbreaking for me. So I think the first thing was realizing, I guess you asked like, what are the greatest challenges was not being able to do something that you love. I mean, that was the first thing, that's just the offset of everything was, how do we now create happiness and fun and joy when we literally have to close, we can't do anything. So initially, I think it was a shock, right? It was, what do we do? Then you kind of go into the scramble mode where you think, what can we do? Then I think the idea started to pump and we thought, well, we have inventory. While we can't sell it in store, how can we shift it online? How can we do more social media selling? How can we tell our story a little bit better? How can we actually communicate to our customers and our community what's happening behind the scenes of Eden? And I tell you, that was our very first pivot, was being honest, transparent, and truthful what was going on. We were scared. We were scared like everybody else. But what we did know was if we were going to be Zooming through work, we were going to get the best necklaces that we could. If we were going to be Zooming for work, well, gone are your pants. I mean, you don't have to wear like really cute jumpers anymore. So we were going to go heavy on tops. And this is how you would style the same top where now maybe for this top, I can show you how to wear it with a camisole, how to wear it off the shoulder, how to even flip it around. So it looks like a different top, how to wear it with a statement necklace, a longer necklace, a pop of color, a scarf, a hat. There's so many things that we're thinking that we can do if we know better, if we know what we have to do, which is stay home for a month, two months, then we knew what we needed to do through Eden as a boutique and have fun and spark joy doing it too. So that was the first pivot that we did. It was really start to take what we did and recreate it in a different way that was likely for a lot of people to be able to adapt to as well. People understood Zoom now, right? We understood that we had to stay home. We understood that we couldn't party. So if that's the case, how can we recreate that fun at home through the products that we have at Eden? I love that you're able to to take sort of the experience that you offered in store, um, you know, accessorizing, looking at different ways to wear things, making things versatile, yeah. and then thinking about, okay, wait, how are these, how are my customers, you know, who are really my family and friends as well, yeah. yep. how are they gonna use it now that they're at home? And totally. 
doing exactly what we are all doing today. Yep. You I laugh because you said, you know, you don't need pants anymore. I will be honest with everybody. I am totally wearing pajama shorts. So, <laughs> I'll be honest. I'm wearing shorts too under this. <laughs> so business on top and shorts on the bottom. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's amazing to, to know that you were able to address people's needs in the same way, but for a new experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, when we were talking earlier, um, you talked about trying to create normalcy um, mm-hmm. and to find different ways to create the same shopping experiences online. Are there Absolutely. other ways that you have managed to do that? Yeah. So a big thing is um, through Eden and Love, obviously, when you go in, you are going in and you're working with a human, right? I mean, you're face to face with someone that we have trained that has product knowledge on everything from our clothing to our totes, to the candles, to the pens that we sell, to the silicone wine caps. They know about everything. Well, we've lost all of that. So now we have to figure out in a really short span of time how to get those products online, which is a whole, that can be a whole nother webinar, getting things online and actually figuring out how can we get people to stop and click and put that item in their cart. And then, I mean, the biggest challenge is how do we get them to check out, right? That's the goal. Because now you don't have anyone that is helping you in the store as a stylist or a product knowledge specialist to really be able to tell you, oh, this candle was hand poured in Hawaii. We have to get you to understand that this smells like guava. Well, what is guava? It also says eucalyptus. What is eucalyptus? So in a very short amount of time, we had to figure out how to shoot items, how to stage items in a lifestyle way, how to load it up online, and how to write a caption that has enough description that is short enough that's going to capture your attention in a millisecond to get you to not just scroll, but to actually stop, click on that item, and put it in your cart. And that, my gosh, I was, I still am a student trying to understand that process. But the great thing is that people are so used to shopping online. They got so comfortable shopping online that it kind of pushed our whole eating community to be comfortable shopping online with us. So it wasn't a question of, but I want to shop in the store. Of course, we all want to shop in store, but right now we know what we have to do. So we will shop online. So we're shopping online. What are the trigger points that I need to have? What are those touch points I need to have? What are those sensory things that we need to have? Like for Black Friday, when we actually launched our website, I said, I want crazy holiday music on there. And everyone was like, you know, our our people are like, I just don't think that's a good idea because people are looking on their phones, they're at work. I said, but that's the thing. It should be an experience. If you're coming to Eden Love's website during Black Friday, we want it to be crazy as if you are at the pop-up that we can't have this year. So different decisions like that, we had to figure out how we were going to create the same feel in store as we are online. We call it a seamless omnichannel experience. And how can we do that in so many different touch points from email? Right. We had to really learn how to curate content that was really strong. That was more storytelling now versus just sale, sale, sale. Social media. How many times are we posting a day? What are we posting about? Do we show more show more of the behind the scenes or do we show more product shots? A lot of it became more behind the scenes. What are we doing? If we're cleaning like everybody was cleaning in that first month, right, when they were staying at home, we're using the cutest Swedish dishcloths. What are Swedish dish costs? Then we had to educate people about it. And all of a sudden, we sold out of Swedish dish costs like five, six, seven, eight times we had to reorder. So it was all about storytelling what we're really doing so people felt connected. And that's one thing that we really had to figure out how to take from our in-store experience online, in emails, and in social media too. Still learning about that. I'm not an expert on that. (laughs) Hey, you know, I think that I mean, the entire world is learning how to pivot and to market themselves online better. And and on the flip side, being a consumer, being a customer, right, we are all also learning how to sort of react to all of this new marketing that suddenly all of our favorite stores are doing. So, um, you know, you make it sound so easy, right? You're so high energy. We did this, this, this. We figured it out. But it can't have been that easy, right? Um, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. Is there, you know, are there stories that you can tell us about um, more of the challenges that you had, especially in the beginning? And then, you know, especially in dealing with your your team and, and your future, uh, what yeah. was that like? Um, there were so many conversations that we had with our team that were challenging. And I think the first one was back in March. 
And um, I was flying back from LA and I was going to go back to Vegas. No one had shut down yet. I think it, we, we just looked at the dates. I think it was March 11th or March 13th. I was flying back. So no one was shutting down yet, but Vegas had already started to see a lot of COVID cases. So we knew something was coming. We knew the governor was going to be speaking on Monday and this was a Friday. I remember getting on a FaceTime call with my team, right? Cause Zoom was still like, what is Zoom? So we're on FaceTime and it was just my two other managers and myself. And I remember one of my managers said, we, we have to close because if we open, the Kapuna will come and we have to close, we have to be safe. And I said, okay, well, give me your reasonings for that. Why do you think, what is the risk versus reward, right? And she was kind of telling her point, crying in tears. My other manager is saying, I, we, we cannot close. There's no way that we can close. We employ, you know, 12 girls here in Hawaii. We have to be able to give them jobs. We have girls in Vegas as well. You know, we have to stay open. It's their, it's their lifeline. It's their paycheck. It's how they pay their mortgage. It's how they provide for their family. And I said, okay, tell me your reasoning. What's the risk and reward there? So we had many conversations. And I remember at the end of that conversation, it really came down to simply themselves. They were scared. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my job? Are we going to be okay? And when you strip out all that other stuff that we're all talking about, what we're worried about, we really are concerned about ourselves. And that's not a selfish thing. That's very fair to ask. So when we had those conversations, I remember everybody was in tears. And I said, I really don't know what's going to happen. That's the truth. I don't know anything more about this virus than you do, but I'm going to do everything that I can as your leader to make sure that I can keep you as safe as I can. That might mean that we have to close. It might mean that we stay open. I don't know. But what I know is I'm going to do everything I can to fight for all of you on your jobs. And just staying present in that role through this entire year, year right now, right? has been probably the single driving force of what has kept our culture so strong. Being communicative, being honest, because every single person that works for me was scared, is scared, because we didn't know what was going on. And I think we had to almost get to the core of it. What is the real issue? Let's talk about that. And we talked about it, and I was as equally as honest as they were, we could really support one another in ways that I never dreamt possible. So as we did close and as we did shut, there was a lot of challenges that we faced. I mean, one of my, the funny challenge, but I mean, it still was a challenge is through April, we had our big party month. So we had a huge shipment that just came in and we had no store to sell it at. And if you understand retail, right? When we're sitting on inventory, that's your cash. Your cash is tied up. So you can't buy anything else until you sell that product. So the three of us are working, two managers and myself and Bryson, my husband. And um, it was, what do we do with all this stuff? Do we just, do we flat lay it? Do we put on a mannequin? And remember, none of us are, are working with one another. We're, I'm working from home, another person working from home, another person is working at the office. So we're trying to figure out how do we socially distance and get this product to one another so we can all share the time to shoot it on mannequins. And then I remember one of my managers who is 12 years younger than me, she said, oh, I know, I have a great idea. Let's selfie. And we're like, what? Okay, I'm in my 40s. I'm like, I don't selfie. I'm not going to selfie. Are you kidding me? How are we going to selfie this? That's ridiculous. Long story short, we had to selfie all like a hundred and something products because we had to get it online in order to sell it, right? If we didn't get online and sell and do selfies, we couldn't have made any money in April. So we had to do the unthinkable and we had to learn how to selfie. And that was a challenge in itself. Hilarious now, not hilarious back when we had to do it. Um, but that was another challenge that we had to face and we had to do it. And for me, I had to suck it up and I had to just do it as well because there was only three of us working. Another big challenge we had was Black Friday. I would say June when we had re well, reopened in May, June, we had already locked in a 30,000 square foot space at Ward that we were going to have a large Black Friday pop-up at. We figured out how we were going to do social distancing and everyone would be six feet apart and we would have parties of groups of 50 versus 500 people coming in at a time. We really thought we had it figured out and then July came and our cases just skyrocketed in Hawaii. And we thought, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Does this mean no Black Friday? We assumed by holiday things would just be like, A-OK. -okay. And sure enough, second lockdown happened and we gathered again and we said, well, we know what we need to do. We know what's right. We have to cancel our Black Friday. Keep in mind, uh, for us as a small business, Black Friday probably is equivalent, that one day is equivalent to about three to four months of our sales. So it's a big day for us with a lot of preparation and losing that revenue to my husband who does all our finances is like, We've got to figure out a way that we can do it. There has to be that we can do it. So we looked at a thousand different ideas that we could do, but truly in our hearts, we knew 
we could be an epicenter. We could be like an Eden epicenter if we had a Black Friday and the Kapuna came or you brought your mom and then people started to get sick. And that's the worst thing that could happen. And I could never live with that. So we canceled. And we said, okay, now if we're going to cancel and we're going to move online, that's a lot of work. We can't have our old rinky dink, um, you know, little old website carrying this with little selfies. That's not going to fly anymore. We had to figure out how we were really going to create a robust website that could hold the amount of sales that we're anticipating we're going to have. So we overhauled our website. We actually hired someone to help us redevelop a whole brand new website. Um, we had our model call and we had our shoots individually. So now instead of having 16 models at a time, we had 16 different two hour shoots with 16 different models. And we just had to do it this way. And we thought, what are all the things we made a list? What are all the things that people love about our Black Friday? And what are all the things that people hate about our Black Friday? Things that they hate the lines. You wait for hours to get in, you wait for hours to try on, you wait for hours to check out. So one thing that we could eliminate was the lines. They want accessibility. So instead of being able to go to this pop-up one time and use a 50% discount, I want to go more than one time. So we created this plan and this program called Get the Code. And when we relate, when we relate the information to our staff, we asked, what do you think? We relate it to our friends and family, we asked them what they thought. And we really got a lot of opinions about this because it's the first time we were gonna pivot in this way. So we ended up selling this $25 code for Black Friday that ultimately gave you three days of Black Friday 50% off shopping for 24 hours. So that's 72 hours of savings. You could do it three times in the month of November. You could buy as much as you want, all for $25, and you got $25 worth of swag. Ultimately, in the end, we ended up doing a lot better than we were ever going to do if we actually had a pop-up. We had about 1,001 sales in 15 minutes, which would have been a whole day of ringing up if we actually had a pop-up pop-up. So that was another big pivot that we had, understanding what our challenges were going to be of losing all that revenue, what's the way that we could actually bring it in. Now, during Black Friday, which is our biggest month, there was the greatest challenges of them all. We had, like I said, 1,000 orders in 15 minutes. You can imagine how many orders we had in a whole day now. So we're doing like 3,000 orders in a day, 5,000 orders. It's stacking up, it's stacking up, it's stacking up. You should see my team was exhausted. They were frustrated. We were just going, we were just like going like wild hyenas, just trying to like pull as many as we can. We had errors. We realized that chip clips that were called uh, Be the Aloha Rainbow, Aloha Rainbow, I mean, they were all getting mixed up. We were shipping out these serving boards, these Shaka serving boards. And when people were getting it, the thumbs were like cracked off and the fingers were cracked off because we weren't packing it properly. We were rushing through a lot of things. We had all these volunteers that we had brought in. So we probably had about 20 people in a day that were coming. After the first weekend, we realized this is way too many people. We're crossing people. People didn't know each other. It just didn't feel as safe. So we had to hit the stop button and actually say, you know, bringing in my team, bringing in my manager and saying, let's slow down and figure out what are the issues that we're running into right now. We were exhausted. No one had days off. We were pulling all day. We were tired. We were hungry. Okay. We had all of these customers that had questions, but no one could get back to them because we were all just so head down trying to pull all these orders. So at that point, we realized that I needed to step out and figure out how can we go back to our, we call it an e-myth system, where you have a visionary, a manager, and technicians. What are the roles that we need to have? How do we stay within those roles so we can foresee not just what needs to get done in the next 10 minutes or 10 hours of the day, what needs to get done in the next 10 days? Because we haven't even thought about December. We haven't even thought about what's going to happen come January. We haven't, and we needed to think about those things. I needed to think about those things because I wasn't just running a Black Friday sale. I was running a company. And that was a big pivotal shift for me as well to realize we can keep shifting, but as we're going into student mode, we still have to step back and look at the bigger picture of what we're trying to do. What are we trying to accomplish? And we have to keep thinking about bigger vision steps. And we weren't through Black Friday because we were just pummeled with orders. Good problem, but a problem. That was a long-winded answer to your question. But <laughs> see, there were many challenges and I can tell you about a lot of them, but that was probably the highlights of them. Thanks for sharing all of that. You know, it's um, it, it's funny because we we positioned this conversation as you know, Eden in love pivoted in the pandemic, but realistically, it's not a single pivot, right? And this is oh no, oh no, no, yeah, it's every time there's a new change in the situation, 
Um, or because you're learning something new, you have to pivot again. Um, absolutely. absolutely. I think every entrepreneur has learned how to pivot and it wasn't just a single pivot. You're right. It's like, you are constantly doing this pivot dance so much that you're dizzy. Like, I don't know how many more times I can pivot, but I can tell you the pivoting isn't done. And you almost have to learn to embrace change because if you don't embrace change, this pandemic is going to roll you over. I mean, it just will. There's just, there's no way that you're going to survive if you're not willing to change even a little bit. And we've changed a lot. I mean, so much that, you know, I had told you that we actually decided that we we're going to close our physical locations. Looking at online versus in-store sales, it's apples to oranges, the number of people that we can service, the reach that we have, the way that we're able to flex and actually bring in more products and go vertical with the things that we have is just unlimited online. And without COVID, I would have never dreamt that. I would have never done that because I'm a shopkeeper at heart. I love visuals. I love setting things up. I love styling people. I love having events. I love face-to-face -face interaction. But COVID changed that. And it made me see things differently. And going online, we can service so many more people and have larger sales and people feel comfortable and safe shopping at home. And I still have half the day where I can do other things and start new projects and ride my bike. And, you know, it's just, it's a different, it's a different way of thinking and it's a different way of living as an entrepreneur for me now. That, that's really great that you're actually finding silver linings, different kinds of, um, of balance, right? I think that a lot of us talk about work-life balance, but entrepreneurs are the worst at having that. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's no such thing, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist often. Um, and you know, you talked about having to step back and to really assess holistically, you know, where are we going? How are we going to accomplish these things? And these yeah. are the things that a lot of small businesses today are are unable to, to you know, uh, really center themselves and find sort of that great balance. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we talked about a, a couple of days ago when we were chatting, um, you know, is, and you touched on it just a little bit when you talked about how you took selfies to survive, basically, um, is sort of moving through things, uh, moving through being afraid, moving through the unknown, um, and sort of how do you, you know, really um, as a leader work with your team to push them through difficult times and through that unknown? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, this year there was so much unknown and there are so many unknowns on so many different levels, whether you're part of our leadership management team, whether you're a stylist, whether you're in Vegas and I can't even physically hug you or talk to you, you know, really when you're in Vegas, I mean, we're Zooming, we're on FaceTime, we're on text, but I think what I have really done to push people through this unknown is really hone in on my listening skills. And I'll tell you as an entrepreneur and, and I don't even want to say that as myself, I'm not a good listener. I'm a doer. I'm, I'm a take charge. I'm a let's run. Who's going to come with me? I'm a, oh my gosh, you want to jump in the water? Let's go. I'm more of that person. And I think for the last 14, 15 years that we've been doing this, 16 years now, actually, because Bryce and I've been for 16 years, we have been on this high where we're just creating. We opened, you know, from the wedding cafe, we started a wedding coordination company, and then we started Eat in Love, and then we expanded, and then we expanded again, and then we had a pop-up and a launch, and then we opened Vegas, then we opened a Waikiki store, then we closed the Waikiki store, and then we opened another store, and it's never ending because for me, I thrive on growth and evolution. That's how I live. That's how I breathe. And this year I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't travel. I couldn't grow. I don't feel like I could evolve in the way that I'm used to. But looking back on this past year now, I realize I have grown more than I did in 16 years because I took the time to actually listen to what my people were saying. What did they want? What do they need? What are they happy with? What are they not happy with? And it's not just my staff, it was even my shoppers. I had the time to actually be there at pickups and talk to my people, talk to my customers, ask them what were the frustrations, ask them what they love and make genuine tweaks because of their suggestions. And that's a really big thing to do when you are in a position to make change in a company and to make someone's life easier. Even if it's just shopping online at your favorite boutique or one of your favorite boutiques, if I can make your life a little bit easier, I've done my job. 
And the last 16 years, I don't know if I've actually done that job. I've done my job of creating and growing and creating hype and excitement, but I don't think that's what the world needed this year. I think we all needed to really scale back a little bit and just connect, just be there for one another, just listen to one another. And I tell you, I think I grew more than ever in this last year, just being still and being centered and, and talking, having conversations, being connected, truly connected, like not being connected, but then really secretly like looking at my texts at the same time or like getting involved because I have like a thousand emails, but yeah, I'm, I'm listening, I'm listening, like truly connecting and listening to the people around me. And um, that's a huge skill. I think that if you can learn as an entrepreneur that you'll go way farther with more people. So if you're an entrepreneur who's always on the go, who like many of us um, multitask during conversations, yeah. in meetings and everything, how do you, um, how do you ground yourself? How do you bring that focus and, and learn to be still? Yeah. What, what's worked for you and what can you share with others? You know, um, I feel really lucky. I feel really blessed. I feel really abundant in my life. We've been able to see a lot, experience a lot, do a lot. And I think right now in my life, I really had to ask myself, what is important to me? What is important to me? This is the first year I got to spend so much time with my parents, like not just traveling and running and going and just dropping in for dinner and leaving and grabbing stuff from the refrigerator. Yes, I used to do that in my 40s, um, but actually sitting with them. And they would come with me and they would help me check in shirts and label things and hang clothes and do stock in the backstock because they couldn't go anywhere either. And it was so amazing. And when you ask like, what has grounded me? Like what keeps me still? It's really being acutely aware of what brings me joy. What makes me happy? Cause does it really make me happy that I'm growing and thriving and, and starting a new business and popping up a new boutique? It could, it could for that moment, it could for that season. And that's, that's fair too, that's fun also. But I think what I've realized in my life is these relationships that I've never had the time to nurture are so important to me. Someone asked me recently, like, what is on your plate right now? Like, what is the most important thing to you? And she knows that if I were in normal times, I would say growing a business, building leaders, um, giving back, social entrepreneurship. But I said, without even thinking, I said, having fun. And she's like, having fun? What do you mean? I said, I know that's so weird, but I don't think in my entire existence of life, I've ever really had a lot of fun. So now we are jamming during the day and we started a bike club. We have like a bike gang of, of you know, my leadership team. And we literally ride around Kaka'aka and we're like, Chew! and we have like bike baskets, bike matching bike bells. We have like pom-poms on our bike baskets and we're just having a blast, but we're having a blast because we feel so connected to one another. And I don't know, Manjali, I think at the end of the day, at the end of all this, when all of this is done and we can get back to normal, I don't think I would change a thing. I don't think I've had such meaningful conversations with people or even look at this. I would have never exposed the darkest sides of Eden or the most challenging parts of Eden because as a business owner, we don't want to share those things. We only want to share the good and the exciting and the big and the hype. But the truth is there is a lot of good, exciting hype, but it comes from challenges. There's opportunities in every challenge, but we can either see it as an opportunity or we're going to sit in it like it's a challenge. And it's either going to help us or it's going to hurt us. And this year, while it could have really hurt us, it's helped us in so many ways. And not only helped us, I think it's healed us as a community and as a company too. That's, that's really powerful. Um, your whole experience and in, in terms of also, you know, finding out really what's important to you, finding those joys finding new joys. I mean, bike club, chi hooing through Kaka'ako sounds <laughs> yeah, fantastic. No, it's ridiculous. Um, if you see us like, don't hunt your horn, we'll probably fall off. <laughs> it's just through their bikes. Um, and, but also, you know, I think the growth that you're seeing in yourself and, and, and really in nurturing the relationships that probably have been there the entire time. Yes, you're right. Yes. Yes. They've been there the entire time. But I've been so busy. I've made myself busy. I'm too busy to spend two hours to have dinner with you, mom and dad, because I need to check my emails. 
I'm too busy to sit in this conversation, you know, Olivia, who I work with or Alyssa, who I work with, because I got a text coming in. I was too busy. I made myself too busy. I think my friendships have gotten better. My relationships have gotten stronger. My marriage has gotten stronger. My relationship with my puppy has gotten better because I can really spend quality time that I'm choosing to give. And because of COVID, it allowed me to realize that time is my most precious commodity. That's the thing that is worth the most to me. So a lot of people are working at home now yeah. and um, find themselves being distracted. Even though they have all this abundant time, a lot of people have a hard time turning off work time and separating it between personal time. Yeah. Um, are there any recommendations that you can make for people who are, are you know, still living this life but are finding that it's not balanced? How can they sit still? Yeah. How can they build those relationships? Absolutely. You know, one thing that I've learned along the way is people, I've always been the one to say like, life work balance, I gotta find balance, I gotta find balance. What I said earlier, I think to me is 100% true. There is no such thing as balance. Instead of balance, I like to say, let's strive for integration. How can we strive for life work integration? Because your life and your work, your personal life and your work life are actually, you're the same human being. You're just sharing your time between things that you are choosing as your priorities. So when I think about it, like if I am on a text and I'm on a text and now instead of watching the news with Bryson, I'm just on a text. Well, there must have been something that was important or valuable of a priority for me to be on that text. So instead of it being like, a, oh, I hate myself because I did that and I didn't get to spend time with Bryce and now he's mad, it's think about what you gained from being on that text at that time. What was it? So when I am on a text and it is really important to me at that moment, it's something I need to figure out. When I share with Bryson, it becomes part of our experience of the night together, our journey, our talk story time, our catch up sessions. Do you know what I'm saying? So it really is integration. So it's knowing that there is no such thing as balance. Like even when you're on a seesaw, you're always like this. You're always striving. You'll ne you actually never sit like this. Or if you do, it's really uncommon, right? In fact, imagine when you're on a seesaw and you're like this, you're almost thinking like, how is it possible that we are not moving. It's almost weird. So instead of striving for that, I mean, strive for integration. There's going to be highs and lows, but again, it's how you see it. Yes, today was a crazy day. It was so nuts. So because of that, wow, maybe tomorrow, let's go on a longer walk. Or gosh, it's such a crazy day. I'm on text all day. So when I'm with Bryson, it's showing him that compassion and saying, gosh, babe, thanks so much for giving me that time. I appreciate you so much. I love you even more. You know, because you understand, you honor the work time that I have. You see the potential that I have when I'm just owning it at my job. So I don't know. I don't believe that there is balance. I think that you're going to be fighting forever to try to find balance. But if you strive for integration, you're so much easier on yourself. And I was really hard on myself for a long time. And what I realized, though, is I love to work. I love my work. I love what I do. It makes me happy. I can't imagine me being the wife, the sister, the friend that I am if I didn't have Eden or the Wedding Cafe or Fred and Kate or any other, any other company that I have. It brings me so much joy and purpose. So I don't want to take that away from myself, but I want to add that into the life that, I'm, that I have. You know what I mean? I, I want to integrate in everything that I do. I want to integrate into my friendships, into my marriage, into, into my family time. I want to share it with my mom and dad. You know, my mom, she does the warehouse pickups every single Wednesday and Saturday. And it's the best because I just get to see her and she does Zumba when she's there and she helps with the projects and people know her as Juju. And gosh, that's, that's the reason for doing this. You know what I mean? That's the reason to see my parents there. And my little nine-year-old niece helped me the other day and she was hanging clothes. And it's just, it's amazing that we can integrate our work life and our personal life if we can do it well. And you give yourself the time and the abundance to do that too. Great lessons, great lessons. Um, uh, to everyone else who's listening and participating, um, we are coming up on the Q&A section shortly. So if you have questions for Dana, please uh, drop it into the Q&A uh, chat box. Uh, if you are on Zoom on your computer, uh, it's on the bottom and looks like two little chat bubbles. Um, 
we did have one question come in so far, and I'm sure that you hear this all the time. And it's from Dana Yap. How did you come up with the name Eden in Love? That's a funny story. So a lot of people think Eden is my middle name. Um, it's not. We worked with a marketing company. So uh, like I was telling you guys earlier, the Wedding Cafe was our first business. And then we had the Wedding Cafe as a subset, like a retail division and the Wedding Cafe at the same time. So a lot of people would say, wow, this is like our best kept secret because we can shop at the Wedding Cafe. We can eat at the Wedding Cafe. But then it got really confusing because people were like, well, I'm not a bride, so I can't shop at the wedding cafe or I, I already got married, so now I can't go there anymore. So we wanted to completely separate the two businesses, which we did. So we took over two locations at Word Warehouse. They were joined and connected, but one was just the wedding cafe and the other one was X. It didn't have a name, which is all of our retail stuff. So we worked with a marketing company and they said, I want you to just think of all the words that you love. So literally on this whiteboard and papers, we just wrote, thousands of words that we love and it ended up at the end of the day with three there was in love together in love because we wanted to have a tie back to the wedding cafe but not say brides or weddings or anything of the sort it was in love it was eden like the garden of eden right because that's like a women's paradise and pomegranate and pomegranate because i just love that word i love how it looked i love saying it i just thought it was hilarious um so we had those three so I remember our marketing company said, okay, it's Friday. On Monday, we're going to regroup. And I want you to come back and try all of those words this weekend and see how it feels. Like, say, in love, say, Eden, say, pomegranate. I'm going to go shopping at pomegranate. I'm going to go shopping in in love. I'm going to go shopping at Eden. Try to see what rolls off your tongue on a Monday. We'll regroup, but I want you to keep using them in sentences. I remember before we left on Friday, I turned to my sister who was working with us at that time. And I said, what if it's Eden in love? And everyone looked at me and was like, that's so weird. Like, why we combine it? I was like, oh, yeah, that's so weird. Why we combine it? And we tried it all weekend. We're like, okay, I'll meet you at Eden and Love. Hello, Eden and Love. Let's go to Eden and Love. We kept saying it over and over. And that's how it was born. So on Monday, we came back and we're like, it's official. It's going to be Eden and Love. And that's how the name came. So this totally could have been pomegranate in love. It could have been, or just pomegranate. Yeah, or in love pomegranate. <laughs> or pomegranate Eden. Eden pomegranate. Uh, marketing companies. I know yeah, exactly what this is like. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so what are we looking forward to in 2021? What does the future hold for Eden in Love? Well, what we know for sure is we're going to be closing both of our stores. So what we realized after going on this online hiatus, we love it. We love the online store. We love having a fulfillment center. We love being able to wake up in the morning and we just have like orders in our inbox. Like it's just the most, it's so fun. Like how, you gotta, anyone that wants to come and just like pull orders for a day, it's super fun. It's like therapeutic, just pulling things and organizing things. And then imagine I get to just count things and inventory. It's just, it's super fun. So we decided collectively that we are going to be ending our lease at South Shore Market at the end of the year. So our lease is up in January of 2022. So we will have nine more months of existence at South Shore Market. Then we'll be going all online in Hawaii. Um, our Vegas store, our lease is up next August. So we have about, you know, a little over a year in Las Vegas, and then we'll be closing that store as well. And really just focusing online uh, focusing on how to grow all of our products vertically. So meaning if we have a design that we really like, like let's just say our gratitude is global, instead of just having tote bags and mask bags and masks, now we can actually create like pillows and comforters and shower curtains. And you can go a lot more vertically when we don't have the, um, when we don't have a lease, when we don't have a uh, rent that we have to pay. It's a lot different, right? We have a lot more flexibility with cash. So we are really excited about more going more vertical and hopefully we'll be able to even start wholesaling products so other stores can start carrying our products as well. How exciting. Yeah, it's super exciting. Um, and lots of, uh, so again, with growth, right? Mm -hmm. um, but growing in a different direction. Yeah, there's so many different things to look forward to. I think that's the main thing. I love being a student right now and just learning a lot about these processes. So for all of your fans, and I'm sure that there are a number of fans uh, on, the, on the call today, um, what, so you talked about pillows and growing vertically, um, are, is there anything else that we can expect? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, are there new products now that they should be looking for 
you know, is this their last chance to try on things in person? Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Well, what's really cool is um, fitting rooms are open at the store. So that's huge. We got this really cool machine that like sprays down the fitting rooms in seconds, which is really awesome. So fitting rooms are back open. So we definitely have more clothing. We have clothing in store. Now clothing in itself, we don't know how we're going to continue that next year because there will be no fitting rooms, but we'll see. We haven't said no to that yet, but we will definitely see how we can custom more stuff. So we just got a whole athletic line in and we just sent it off to the printer to um, put on some cute little embroidery like on the back of a sports bra on the bottom of your bike shorts so just really cute things that make it eat in so we really want to eat and fight everything that we have like everything from you know your backpacks to your shower curtains to we have floor mats that are coming in all in really 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 cute patterns and stuff too art can I show you guys one thing we have these backpacks coming in so people have been asking us to make these small little backpacks forever so this is a prototype of one that I have but this is actually coming in at the ending of April and people are going to go bananas for these just because of the size the structure the quality of these so it's just making all these new products that we have. I even want to do a whole travel line. I mean, obviously it's not appropriate right now, but when we're back to traveling, you bet you're going to see a travel line come out from Eden. So we just, we have a ton of ideas. Every day we have ideas and we're constantly talking to different vendors about making slippers, yoga mats, um, plastic bags, you know, just little like Ziplocs that you can carry around. There's so many different products that we can create, um, but we just have to figure out what does the market want. And that's why a lot of these conversations are so important. So I can hear what kind of things do you want? What is the price point that you want to see? And then we just go and we do our research and we're constantly researching and talking with different vendors. And that's kind of my main job. Awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, everyone, we have arrived to our Q&A session. If you have any additional questions that you want to ask, um, please go ahead and hit that Q&A chat box, or you can drop it into the regular chat. Um, we're going to continue our talk story um, as questions filter in. Um, I think in the meantime, while we wait for those questions to come in, what I want to know is um, what are two pieces of advice that you can give to people who want to start a business. So new mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, um, you know, you have years of experience. I'm actually a, still a new entrepreneur. I'm only in my second year. So um, I'm That's still learning time. lots. That's oh the man. Best, oh, the beginning times are the best times. Um, so what's two pieces of advice that you would give to any entrepreneur mm -hmm. um, who are, who's new? And then what's two pieces of advice you would give to someone who has been in an established business for a long time and maybe need a little bit of an oomph. Yeah, okay. Um, one thing that I would say to people that are just getting started is something that, okay, when I got out of college, I remember, I'll never forget, I applied for a bridal magazine. I was a journalism major. One thing that I always tell students, if I'm ever talking to like college students or high school students, I always tell them one piece of advice I would give to you, if you don't know what you wanna do, go into journalism. It's so important to learn how to write and how to speak. That will take you far if you can learn how to write and you can learn how to speak. So that's one thing I always tell younger entrepreneurs if they're just getting out of college or starting college or they're right in high school. When you are getting out of college, I remember I applied for a bridal magazine position and I was so gung-ho and I was so overly dressed. I think I even carried like a briefcase. I don't even know where I got a briefcase from, probably Ann Taylor. And I, I walked in. I remember she told me she really put my place. She goes, I really like you. I think you have a lot of potential, but I want to let you know you're not going to become a publisher overnight. And I remember looking at her and I was like, what do you mean? And she said, it takes years to build your portfolio, to build credibility. And it's going to, I know that you're anxious and I know that you want to do this. And I love the energy that you bring, but you have to realize you have to start from the ground up and work really hard. And I'll be here to teach you everything that you need, but you're not going to become a publisher overnight. And I remember walking out thinking like, oh, she doesn't know I'm going to become a publisher overnight. But of course she was right. And I was not a publisher overnight. Um, but the lesson from that is you have to put in your time and not just time, but I mean, start somewhere, start somewhere. Like in the beginning, you may not write the largest story for the bridal magazine, but even writing a small clip is going to be important to put in your portfolio. I may not land the Holly Kulani as an account but I may land a smaller boutique hotel or a bread and breakfast or something, you know? So you just wanna start somewhere. So I would say if you wanna get into state retail 
and you're not sure how you want to start a boutique and this is not the area that you're in right now, I would say just get a retail job. Go part-time, ask questions, be interested, follow people that you really like on social media that are doing that also. Just be interested. I would say that's the most important piece of advice that I can give. Now, if I can add to someone that's already been in their business and needs a little refresh, I would actually say the same thing. I would say be interested and step back and be interested in what's going on around you. So like I was telling even earlier, right, it's asking questions, talk to your people, find out what's going on, get into that lunchroom and we can have lunchrooms again and actually have conversations with your people. The ones that are on the front line and ask them, how is the business going? Give me three pieces of feedback that you hear from people. What are things that we're doing great? And what are things that we can actually improve on? And listen, 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 listen with your ears and actually try to make positive change. You'd be surprised how every company can tighten up in so many different ways. Um, so that's one thing I would do. And I think you're going to realize that your own people within your organization have so much feedback, valuable, valuable feedback, if you just take the time to listen to them too. You know, uh, this is a perfect segue. You mentioned about making change. Um, and Gina, who is listening with us today, um, says, I love how Eden in, in Love was giving back and shopping with a cause before it was trendy. How do you choose which causes and groups to support? And then how has COVID, COVID impacted that effort this year? Uh, okay, so giving back is always part of our DNA. That's just something that I believe if you can do, you should do. I hate using that word should, but in this case, I think that if we can as human beings do good, we should be doing good. I just do. That's the fundamental core of what I believe. Um, so with retail, it gave us an e easy segue to be able to give, right? So for us, it was donate $10, you get 20% off. You give, we give, everybody gets to give. It's a great all around circle that we're creating. Um, how we pick the organizations that we give to really, I think a lot of it is just our personal interests. It's what do we love? What's important to us? Back in 2012, if you can think of the biggest ones that we've done, um, giving uh, internationally to third world country was very important to me. So Sri Lanka was a non-negotiable. I wanted to be able to go. I wanted to go on ground. I wanted to support them at Adopt the Village for five years. So it was just something that really was calling me personally. Um, gives that we've done that were even a little bit more fun. We've given to the Humane Society, the Domestic Violence Action Center, um, the YWC. There's so many local organizations that we have given to as well. Um, but the ones that we did most recently were for Bryson's birthday, we said, what do you want to do? Let's make it a birthday project gift. So we'll collect $10. They'll get 20% off in store. Um, and we'll raise this money to do an Eden for Good project. What do you want to do? And he's like, well, I love the UH band. I was like, the UH band or the UH football team? He's like, well, I mean both. So, I mean, he loves the football team, but he loves the band supports the football team. One of our shoppers is one of the band directors. So he said, we really want to be able to give bentos to the entire band. She goes, really? I said, yeah. She goes, like no one gives to the band. I said, Bryson wants to give to the band for his birthday. So that's what we're going to do. So sure enough, we went to practice and we donated like hundreds of bentos from Tanya because Jamba Juice partnered with us at the same time. Coach Rolo was there. So about two years ago, they did that Hawaii Five-0 like dun, 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 dun. They did it for Bryson. He was in tears. So all the gives that we do end up being better gives for us. You know what I mean? So it's things that really impact us that are important to us. Again, listening to your team and figure out where they want to give. Um, for Olivia and for, for me, our birthday is in September. And what we really want to do, we've always wanted to give away Christmas trees. So we did like a Christmas tree giveaway. Again, we raised money in store and we donated. We picked seven people and we bought them flocked trees. And it was just so cool because it was all these stories of people that never had a flocked tree or weren't able to get a tree, but we picked them randomly on social media and we met them down there. And our whole thing was like, let's get flocked. And we just did this coolest thing with all the different trees and people got to pick it and we did this photo shoot and just doing things that were really important to us and relevant at the time. Same thing for Kauai when they had their flooding and when the volcanoes were hitting Big Island, we took 12 people from our team and we just raised money in store. We didn't know what we were gonna do with the money, but we literally went on this trip and we just bought local. So we went down to Hilo and we just purchased from every single local company that we could find. We would buy like hundreds, $200. We just gave people cash and we said, just buy things. All the items that we bought, we put it on social media and we just did giveaways for all of it. And we went to like all of these unknown small mom and pop farmers markets and we we're buying like their earrings, their artwork, and we're putting on social media and just giving it away. Just being able to stimulate their economy. Same thing for Kauai. We did a one day trip in Hilo and one day trip in Kauai. And those are the kind of things that I think mean the most to us because it's relevant and it's important. 
Does that does that answer your question, Gina? Gina uh, says, well, well, I guess the the other part of it was has that changed now that it's COVID? Right, right. Um, it hasn't. It hasn't. I think right now it changed a little bit just because our sales are a little bit different where we're not able to give the way that we want, right? Like actually go to Kauai or go to the Big Island or go. And we're very hands on, even from Sri Lanka. We wanted to go to Sri Lanka. What I think we're doing right now, um, like right now it's spring break. So what we've decided to do is for every teacher that comes in, they're gonna get this special $24 pack of a mask and a mask bag. So giving in different ways, like right now, teachers mean a lot to us, right? Giving them masks, giving them things that they can actually realize that we think that they are heroes and we are championing for them. So we're still giving in different ways based on the relevancy of what's going on and the importance that the cause has to us too. Thanks for sharing that. So we are, four minutes away from the end of our program. There are still a few more questions and I want uh, to let everybody know that we will answer them by, uh, by messaging you afterward. Um, and we'll send a follow-up so that everyone can see the answers to these questions. Um, one last thing, tell us a little bit about Aloha Bloomies. Okay. Um, so what is it? We know it's new. Um, what inspires you to create those characters and um, where can we find them? Okay, so Aloha Bloomies is just one of our design patterns that we have, but I have to say it's my favorite. And I know we say this every single time that every single design we release is our favorite, but honestly, this one is my favorite. I just love the way that this one came out. The designs are always inspired um, really, again, by things that we love. We talk every single day with my uh, designer and we just talk about things that we really love, things that are meaningful to us. This pattern was really cool because Olivia, who is one of my managers, just made 10 years with us in March. And we said, we want to dedicate a pattern to you, a design. So what are your favorite things? And she said, flowers. I love flowers. I love being out in my garden. I was raised like picking poikini kini and putting it in like, you know, little jars and glasses around my house. So. Alyssa designed this floral pattern for Olivia, which turned out to be all of our favorites. So that's what Aloha Bloomies is about. If I can tell you a little bit about backstory though, I said Alyssa's our designer. She's also my other manager that I've been um, speaking of. Um, Alyssa has been with us also for nine years and has really done tremendous work. She's a self-taught designer. So she taught herself how to design everything. And back in 2019, the year before we went into COVID, I personally was feeling like I was in this funk. I call it my year of meh, you know, like M-E-H, like you're not happy, you're not sad, you're just kind of like meh, like things are going great, but I'm not super happy. I don't know why, I'm not sad, but I'm not like joyful. I'm not, you know, I was just kind of meh. And I remember one day when we were meeting, she drew a happy face on the pineapple. And I was like, don't draw a happy face on a pineapple. Like that just looks so childish. And I remember looking and I was like, oh, it's kind of cute. I said, can you put a happy face on the shaka? And she did. And at that point, we started putting happy faces on almost everything just to be funny, just to be silly. And she did it because she just wanted to make me smile. And that single-handedly changed everything about Eden and Love, everything. So yeah, my husband just dropped this. This is the Aloha Blue News pattern. But it's just so super cute and happy and vibrant. And this has by far been one of our most popular prints. And we have an entire line of insulated things coming out. So cooler bags, lunch totes, I mean the whole the whole gamut about Aloha Bloomies. You can find it Eat and Love obviously on eatandlove.com. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, well so here we are. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you so much Tana for your time and sharing your inspirational story. Thank and, you. And you know your learning silver linings and really making people realize how much work goes into everything. I'm going to turn everything over to Raina now and uh, take us home, Raina. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tana and Manshali. I feel so re-energized just sitting back and listening to you both chat. Um, it's a it's a shot in the arm of energy that I personally really needed um, to, to see, to listen to, to your story, Tana, and all the energy you put into something because you're passionate and you love it. Yep. And I think you're right, you know, integration. That's, I think, the thing that I learned <laughs> from, you, from you today as a student. Um, and I think Marceline would attest to this, that I'm passionate about 
the next generation of leaders that are coming, that are in our community doing great things. That's you, Tana, that's you, Manchali, and many, many others on this call. Um, as a baby boomer, I, I'm looking to you all to, you know, really, uh, I don't know, just create a great place for us to live here in Hawaii. Yeah. And um, your, both of your energies inspire me. Um, and please keep doing what you're doing. And Tana, I want to invite you to join our Josh Next Gen group because it will be it will be great fun to have you with us. And um, we have a great group. But anyway, great good luck to you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to shopping online now since you know <laughs> since I now know we won't, I won't be able to go to South Shore Market Store very much longer. But still, love your products. Thank love you. everything you've been doing. I went to the wedding um, cafe. <laughs> you know, back way back when, and um, yeah, and so, but it's it's a testament to how how things need to evolve, how you need to be open to change, yeah. and how you have to stay relevant. Yeah, absolutely, you hit it on the nose. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you both, and um, see you again soon. <laughs> thank you.